Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and with psalms. When you appear on the last day and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock, and he established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives, now and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, by your precious cross you have given us perfect salvation and made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming. Blessed are you, O wood of the Holy Cross, for you erased Adam's curse, and you restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you have united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you fulfill the words of the prophets, enlighten the apostles in their preaching, ground the martyrs for their faith, and honor the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the Feast of the Exaltation of your Holy Cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt your Holy Church and guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue, Purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the young. Protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross on the great day of your second coming that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever.
saved by your holy cross, O Lord. May we enter with the saints into heaven's lasting joy. Lord, may your cross guard your holy faithful church everywhere throughout the world. Keep all scandal far from her. Keep her free from harm and strife, that your lasting peace may reign for all ages yet to come. May the children of the church find their shelter and their strength in the Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of the incense that we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us that we may walk with you toward death. And then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shant, Aloho, Shant, sign of your cross, Lord, you ordain your holy priests, and they give us the mysteries through the power of your cross. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Baruch Mor Dilan, glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are the most pitiable of men. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, 
The resurrection of the dead came also through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so too in Christ shall all be brought to life, but each one in his proper order. Christ, the first fruits, and then, at his appearance, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to his, to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every, so every sovereignty and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has placed all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he subjected everything under his feet. But when it says that everything has been subjected, it is clear that this excludes the one who subjected everything to him. When everything is subjected to him, then the Son himself shall also be subordinate to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what shall people accomplish by having themselves baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they having themselves baptized for them? Moreover, why do we endanger ourselves all the time? Every day I face death. I swear it by the pride in you, my brothers and sisters, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. If at Ephesus I fought with beasts, so to speak, what benefit was it to me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But do not be led astray. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. And I say this to your shame. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle Matthew writes, Then Jesus left the temple area and was going away when his disciples approached him to point out the temple buildings. He said to them in reply, you see all these things, do you not? Amen, I say to you, there shall not be left here a stone upon a stone that shall not be thrown down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, 
the disciples approached him again privately and said, Tell us when shall this happen, and what sign shall there be of your coming and the end of this age? And Jesus said to them in reply, See that no man deceives you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You shall hear of wars and reports of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for these things must happen, but it shall not yet be the end. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes from place to place. All these are the beginning of the labor pains. Then they shall hand you over to persecution, and they shall kill you. You shall be hated by all nations because of my name. And then many shall be led into sin. They will betray, and they will hate one another. Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because of the increase of evil doing, the charity of many shall grow cold. But the one who perseveres to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. This is the truth, peace be with you. Awake, you just, and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. And this I speak to your shame. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Paul, when he writes this letter, he's talking about a false spirituality, one which is actually quite common these days. What St. Paul is reminding us in this section on the resurrection of the dead is that the resurrection of the dead is part of the reality of how we practice and live the gospel. It's not just some remote thing that may or may not happen in the future. It is part of the reality here and now. So what St. Paul is talking about is a reminder to us that every human being is created in the image of God. This we know. But as I've mentioned to you in the past in the Syriac tradition for the fathers, the image of God is Christ incarnate. Adam and Eve are created in the image of the word incarnate, obviously thousands of years before our Lord was ever going to enter into the world. Sin obscures that image. Our selfishness obscures that image. It doesn't make it disappear, but it puts it under a shadow. It mutilates it. It wounds it. It disrupts it. And so what St. Paul is reminding us is that our Lord, who is the first fruits of the dead, he comes, he, go, he embraces death, he overturns death on its head, the ultimate sign of Adam and Eve's first choice in opposition to God, sin. And he overturns death on its head to not only radiate and manifest his glory as the Son of God incarnate, but also to show us the path that we were meant to have been by grace already. Adam and Eve, as we mentioned to you before, humanity was that you would come to the end of your days in the earth and be transfigured in glory and simply ascend into the existential vision of God. That was the original plan. So our Lord coming of the harvest of humanity, the first fruits to be reaped, our Lord is then, in his resurrection, 
not just simply someone who redeemed the world and something glorious happened to, but he is the image and the reality into which each of us are engrafted by our baptism. And that's why he uses the image. And as sin entered the world through one man, so also life enters one man. So as all fall by Adam, so all are raised up within Christ. So it's a parallel that he's doing. And of course, it's, not, it's important for us to know this letter is being written to the Corinthians. So they're Greeks. And the whole Greek notion of the afterlife, the Elysian fields, all of this aspect of going someplace where it's just really nice if you're good here below. That's the basic pagan notion. As we mentioned to you over and over again, a lot of Christians think in this terminology that what we call heaven, which again, the word just means the sky, this change that takes place within us is a transformation within the Christ which is ultimately the resurrection, though we ourselves still carry this cross behind our Lord for the time being. So what our Lord is reminding the Corinthians, because there are Corinthians who are just simply saying, well, there's no resurrection. The body coming back from the grave. This is stupid, doesn't make any sense. For the Greeks, that is nothing that they would wrap their head around. For them, the body, material stuff, you know, snotty-nosed little kids, all the other oozing that we do as human beings. All, why would you want that back? And so remember that when St. Paul first preaches in Athens, when he starts talking about Anastasis, resurrection, and Yeshua, they think he's talking about a god and a goddess. Yeshua and then his consort, Anastasis. When, he, when they realize that he's talking about, no, the body, that the individual person will be regathered and glorified in his personal being, they start laughing at him. This is ridiculous. Why would you want that? Because the Greeks had very much the pagan notion we have today is that somehow death is freedom and the soul flies away and then we just burn the body and either dump it in a river someplace or shoot it off in fireworks or do something else to it, which of course is not what Christians have done for 20 centuries. We have surrounded that body with great respect and reposed it, laid it to rest, waiting for the day of glory when our Lord appears. So in the modern world, our notion is very pagan about going off to some happy fields where you get to meet your puppy again, and oh, maybe your children also, but you know, definitely the dog. And this whole idea of just somehow being another human state somewhere else freed from the body. And that's what the Corinthians, that's why they're denying the resurrection. And so they're interpreting the resurrection of our Lord in a spiritualized sense. It's not really Christ who comes physically out of the tomb transfigured by glory, grace, divinity. It is simply, it's, it's he went to God. And of course that's the resurrection. And St. Paul is saying that is not the resurrection. The resurrection is that the tomb is empty. There is no body. That is the resurrection. And he gives a number of arguments in this section. But what he's insisting upon is that the life of the gospel lived by those who are anointed of the life of Christ is a resurrection that we are focused towards and the resurrection which begins to transform us now already. It's not something we wait for. We do this also in a pagan way where religion is something that we do by grafting it on when it's convenient. I go to the temple of Jupiter because I have exams next week. This is the way in paganism is you go to the temples and ask for goodies. In fact, it's very funny because in Japan, what you do is there's also usually a bell and you ring the bell as if you have to wake up the divinity at the Shinto shrine and then you make a wish. But that's the way many people deal with religion. That's the way they see God. They don't see their lives as being transfigured within the divinity now. That is what we call grace. 
And that is the life, this resurrection, which is the full restoration of that image of God in which the first man and the first woman were created, in which every single one of us, their children, are, have been created. So the resurrection is not something extra and isn't it pretty. The resurrection is meant to be the restoration of what we were intended to be in the first place. And this is why you have one little phrase at Vatican II where it says, they make, it's a very beautiful statement in fact, that they say that Christ reveals man to what he is. And when you first look at it thinking, what does that mean? That is one of those moments in which they're taking an Eastern notion and putting it into this Roman council. Because Christ's appearance in the world is yes, the Son of God, but as man, he's showing us what we were meant to have been. And so that's what St. Paul is dealing with in this section. As in Adam all die, and so in Christ all shall be made alive. It is the focus upon the life of the grace which is working within us now, which will be a full flourishing in the day of the resurrection, when Christ appears in his glory. So that full manifestation of glory in our Lord's appearance is indistinguishable from his resurrection. It's just that it will be the last universal, at this point, manifestation of this life. Now, as we've been doing over these weeks, we've been talking about St. Ephraim. And St. Ephraim has a whole series of hymns on virginity. Now, you say the word virginity today in the modern world, and people start tittering. They just start giggling. What a funny idea. A virgin, wow. Poor thing. That's the way the world looks at it because they don't understand what is the celibacy that has been around from the very beginning. That our Lord was celibate. St. John, most of the apostles, the only one we even know that was married was Peter. So this, and why would you embrace this? And so St. Ephraim insists upon the focus. And remember we told you a few weeks ago, he is ihidoyo. He lives a consecrated individual ascetic life that embraces celibacy. He's not a monk, he's not in that sense, he's not a hermit, he lives in town, he's a catechist, he teaches, he directs choirs, he, he is very much active among the people, but he lives this life of ihidoyo, this virginity which was consecrated at his baptism. He was baptized at 20, and at 20 he not only received the anointing of Christ, he also embraced to follow Christ also in his virginity, in his celibacy. There is a very beautiful hymn that is done in which St. Ephraim contemplates the Blessed Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross, St. John at the foot of the cross, and our Lord. And what is taking place in these three individuals who are all celibate, who are all virginal. And what he does in this exchange is he asks that we in this hymn, he asks that we ourselves also be clothed with the beauty of this virginity of John, that we enter truly into the footsteps of John, who is given to the mother of God and who is the faithful disciple at the foot of the cross. So the question that it becomes is why? There is a beautiful line in the hymn where he says, it is amazing how much the clay is able to re be imprinted by the beauty of the sculptor. So in contemplating John at the foot of the cross and the mirror, which is the Blessed Virgin Mary, he talks about the admirable aspect of this clump of clay that we call John, of how admirable it is that the sculptor who's dying on the cross should be able to so profoundly imprint his image on that clump of clay. But as the hymn goes on, St. Saint, Saint Ephraim reminds us that we are the ones also like John who are called to walk in his footsteps. And that virginity then becomes not a question of you don't have sex, which is the way everyone obsesses over. The question of the virginity is to universalize our love. When we are married to someone, that love is exclusive. It's meant to be exclusive and possessive in that sense. But the celibacy allows the person to have a charity and a love, not in a possessive manner, but in a universal manner 
to basically everyone that you should come in contact with. And so he's talking about this model that comes in and this impress upon the clay. So that for Saint Ephraim, the virgin, and this is connected with the resurrection because the virgin exemplifies most perfectly the concentration of the individual within the individual of that inner presence of Christ. Saint John, Saint, excuse me, Saint Paul makes a very simple observation when he writes in one of his epistles by saying, the man who's married is distracted. He's got bills to pay, he's got children to spank, he's got grass to cut, he's got things to do. And he says the same thing for the woman. She's cooking, she's taking care of children, she has to do whatever she has to do also. They're distracted by all of these things. And that's not bad, he's not saying it's bad, but because it's a distraction. Distraction literally means in Latin, dis trahare, means to be pulled away from. So that in the service of our Lord, he says for that husband and for that wife, their first intention has to be to satisfy their spouse and the family. They don't ignore the Lord, they're just pulled away from the Lord. So that celibacy allows the individual to concentrate and to focus upon that inner presence of Christ, which belongs to all the baptized. But when the celibate is free, free from those distractions, whether they live in the desert, whether they live in a monastery, or, or as with St. Ephraim, they live in the middle of the population. They are still free, and their charity is universalized. And because of that, the image of the Blessed Virgin and St. John are very important for St. Ephraim. His hymns on, on virginity are like the, one of the largest parts of the collections of his poetry. So that for him, the Ihidoyo, the Virgin exemplifies this most perfect concentration of this inner presence of Christ, which leads to the full restoration of the image of God which belongs to us by our creation. So if you see the linking, is that the idea of the hidoyutho, the idea of virginity consecrated in the church from the very beginning has always been the idea to be unshackled and to be free to allow Christ to do within us exactly what he came to do without the distractions and without the illusions that come from being plunged into this world. And that love leads to imitation. Or it's meant to lead to imitation. And that's why, to finish with, St. Paul says, I die daily. It's a very striking phrase. Because he's talking about the resurrection and everything, and he's giving these arguments of why the resurrection has taken place. And then he says, now morally, I, I die daily. Now, in his letter to the, to the Philippians, he uses this phrase where he says, my whole intent is that I may know him, that I may know Christ, and that I may know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, therefore, in his sufferings. This is how we embrace the cross, not because we want pain. We embrace the cross in this fellowship of sufferings because our desire is to know the power of the resurrection. It's a very beautiful idea. And St. Paul finishes by saying that being made conformable to his death, that if I have fellowship with the sufferings of the cross and I focus upon that inner grace which is the resurrection within me, then I have the flourishing in being, commend, commend, being conformed to his death, I then have the hope of the power of the resurrection. So it all links together, and that's why when St. Paul says to the Corinthians, if all we do is just have Jesus in this life, and isn't that nice, we get together on occasion and eat muffins and talk to each other. It's just a social gathering. He says, if that's what it is, we are the most pitiable and the most wretched of all people on the face of the earth. Because why embrace the cross? Why follow in a, why, why be celibate and, and not have a family? We're the most wretched and the most pitiable. But if the resurrection is the truth, then there is glory given to us. And that's why what St. Paul leaves us with is to understand is that when we talk about the mortification, 
The word itself, mores, is death. To be conformed to the death of the cross of our Lord. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. The word literally means mortification as the action of putting to death. But the purpose is not the death. The purpose is the resurrection and the restoration of the image of God within us. And that is why he says in one of his hymns, St. Ephraim, that Mary Magdalene turned her face away from everything. That's to despise. I mean, in English, when we say despise, it means I hate something and I hold it in contempt. But the word despise, de speechere in Latin, literally means to turn away from. You look away. So St. Ephraim picks about this idea of despising of the world with Mary Magdalene, that she turned her face away from everything in order to gaze upon the one beauty alone. Her conversion is not, oh, I'm wicked, I was a harlot, isn't this terrible, I've got to repent from my impurities, and now I'm good and I'm a contemplative. That is not the story of Mary Magdalene. The story of Mary Magdalene is she allowed herself to, to look away from those illusions of the world and not to no longer to be seduced by them. And in looking away, she was able to put behind those impurities. But why was she even able to look away in the first place? Why was she able to be mortified in the first place? Is because she sought the face of the unique and divine beauty. Why do we stumble and commit the same sins over and over again? Because we don't look away. We go back exactly to the same occasions. We get on the phone with that same person. We go to that same website. We do all these things again and again and again. And of course, we fall because we walk right into the same causes. Not until we realize the ability to despise. Day speech today, to look away. I know what this thing does to me. I'm not even going to look at it because I'm going to pursue beauty and the truth and goodness. When that is part of our life, we will look away. We can't look away and we go back to our sins continually, same causes, same effects, because we are addicts of those occasions. We cannot pull ourselves away. My last $15 and I still go on the website to gamble it away on a poker site. Why? Because I don't see anything else than that. And when I'm able to pull away from that because I desire to see something else, then my life is transformed. And the image of God is able to flourish as it was meant to be created. There is a very simple logic in it. Is it easy? No. I like this website. I like this person. I like being on the phone with this individual. I like texting to these people. I do these things because I like them, because I haven't seen anything more. And that is why when we continue to ask for the increase of our faith, so that our desire is to gaze upon true beauty, true goodness, and what is truly infinite love, when we have that as our strength working within us, that course that we make is the mortification to put to death those illusions, to put to death those attractions by being able then to look away. This is what St. Paul is linking together in this section in the letter to the Corinthians. And why St. Ephraim for the 67 years or 47 of his 67 years embraced the life of celibacy. It was to be free. It was to allow his personal love to become universalized for everyone. The church, first and foremost. The people that he taught. Which he could not have done if he had been home trying to figure out how are we going to pay the bills this month. And so he's able to unshackle, which is why our Lord links to celibacy also with poverty. To let it all go in order to have that freedom to look away to see beauty, and in doing so, to be transfigured and the image of God within us by that grace. So that's why the original quotation we gave at the beginning of this sermon is St. Paul says, now awake, be vigilant. Awake you just, you've been anointed in the Lord. 
Awake, you just, and do not sin. And then he says, but it's sad because there's so many among you who have no knowledge of God. He's not talking about pagans. He's talking about the baptized. And he says, for there are many among you who do not have the knowledge of the God. And this I have to say to your shame. It's a beautiful line, very severe, but it comes from a heart that is broken because we have been promised so much more. And a life which is transfigured not after death, but transfigured now. If only we embrace that grace, desire to see the true beauty, and break ourselves away from the causes that make us stumble and fall way too many times. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born and Father before our ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. For him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit, and the Son of God, and the Church of the Lord, he came in. For our sake, he was crucified in the conscious fire. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in the court of the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven. And the seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come in and glory to try us to the living of the dead, and has seen him on that night. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the glory and glory who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead the life of the world to come. Amen.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. We remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us. We recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Vincent de Paul. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. We continue with the Anaphora of the Twelve Apostles on page 754, 754. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor, love and faith that are pleasing to God. and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever 
O Lord, we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy. Make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim, who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify, and proclaim. Holy is your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and holy is your life-giving Spirit. You are holy and the giver of all that is good. For our salvation, your only begotten Son became flesh of the pure Virgin Mary, and by his divine plan he saved and redeemed us. And <laughs> Dachlo faikun wachlof sagie me tapaseo me tihel Husunion haume wa hoin an alam alamin Ho kano alkoso damsi ho men hamro men mayo Barahu Kadesh, Nabil Talmida Karomara, Sabishtawa Mehne Kulhu, Hono Denita, Demohon Dila Diati Kihadato, Dahlof Paikun, Wahlof Sagi, Metan Shadow Metihem, Husunion. How may we hide on Alam Alamin? Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do so in memory of me until I come again. Lord, 
lover of all people, we remember your plan of salvation, and we ask you to have mercy on your worshipers, and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time, to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, O oh Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We since he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith, blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings. Forgive them so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. For you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people may we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest, hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf, and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. 
with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb for your mercy. May our prayer rise like an incense, which we are offered to your Father through you, to you, to you, to you. Compassionate Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy, pray with purity and holiness, and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, with thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For the kingdom of God, and the glory of God, and the Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. And do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us, for yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness. That through them we may be forgiven and made holy and we raise glory to you now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be the Lord. Make us worthy, O Lord, so that our bodies may be sanctified and our souls purified by the life of the blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for the life of the Lord our God, to you, glory forever.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and the glory of your holy name, and that of your only Son, and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation, and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So obviously today, if you've read the bulletin, you know that it's rather unique. So normally, yesterday should have been our annual Hofli. Lots of excellent music, lots of dancing, lots of really, really good food. But alas, 
It's the apocalypse. So you all have to go home and hide in your basement. Nevertheless, the years roll by, and we have, of course, we were going to celebrate with great hoopla the anniversary of the birth of our beloved Dame Fifa, who to this day, which is a taboo, I know, but on her 95th birthday, she is still directing the choir. Since we cannot do a full celebration, we have not a birthday cake, but many, many little birthday cakes all wrapped up in individual sacks. That as you leave, we will be distributing the muffins, which are normally our muffins and coffee after Mass, will be on your way out. So to remember, there will be an unusual uh, recessional, but you'll recognize it immediately. Pray for FIFA. We cannot thank her enough for being the living archives and the situ of the parish at the age of 95. And so, as you enjoy your uh, magnificent muffins, and they are quite good, uh, send up a little prayer of thanksgiving for the goodness of God upon this parish. And of course, for many, many years, another 95 for Dame FIFA. Maburuk. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.